Hi everyone, it's Cassie, the Young Teen Librarian at East Hampton Library. Tonight we are continuing with reading through Cheaper by the Dozen, and we are continuing with Chapter 15, Gilbreths and Company. Dad's theories ranged from Esperanto, which he made us study because he thought it was the answer to half the world's problems, to Immaculate Conception, which he said wasn't supported by available biological evidence. His theories on social poise, although requiring some minor revision as the family grew larger, were constant to the extent that they hinged on unaffectation. A poised, unaffected person was never ridiculous, at least in his own mind, Dad told us. And a man who didn't feel ridiculous could never lose his dignity. Dad seldom felt ridiculous and never admitted losing his dignity. The part of the theory requiring some revision was that guests would feel at home if they were treated like one of our family. As Mother pointed out, and Dad finally admitted, the only guest who could possibly feel like a member of our family was a guest who, himself, came from a family of a dozen headed by a motion study man. When guests weren't present, Dad worked at improving our table manners. Whenever a child within his reach took too large a mouthful of food, Dad's knuckles would descend sharply on the top of the offender's head with a thud that made Mother wince. Not on the head, Frank, she protested in shocked tones. For mercy's sakes, not on the head. Dad paid no attention except when the blow had been unusually hard. In su such cases, he rubbed his knuckles ruefully and replied, Maybe you're right. There must be softer places. If the offender was at Mother's end of the table out of dad's reach, he'd signal her to administer the skull punishment. Mother, who ne never disciplined any of us or even threatened discipline, ignored the signals. Dad then would catch the eye of a child sitting near the offender and by signals would deputize him to carry out the punishment. With my compliments, dad would say when the child with the full mouth turned furiously on the one who had knuckled him. If I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times to cut your food up into little pieces. How am I going to drive that into your skull? Not on the head, Mother repeated. Mercy, Maud, not on the head. Anything with an elbow, anyone with an elbow on the table might suddenly feel his wrist seized, raised, and jerked downward so that his elbow hit the table hard enough to make the dishes dance. Not on the elbow, Frank. That's the most sensitive part of the body, any place but on the elbow. Mother disapproved of all forms of corporal punishment. She felt, though, that she could achieve better results in the long run by objecting to the part of the anatomy selected for punishment, rather than the punishment itself. Even when Dad administered vitally needed punishment on the conventional area, the area where it is supposed to do the most good, Mother tried to intervene. Not on the end of the spine, she'd say in a voice indicating her belief that Dad was running the risk of crippling us for life. For goodness sakes, not on the end of the spine. Where then, Dad shouted furiously in the middle of one spanking. Not on the top of the head, not on the side of the ear, not on the back of the neck, not on the elbow, not across the legs, and not on the seat of the pants. Where did your father spank you? Across the soles of the, of the bi-jingled feet like the heathen Chinese? Well, not on the end of the spine, Mother said. You can be sure of that. Skull wrapping and elbow thumping became a practice in which everybody in the family, except Mother, participated until Dad deemed our table manners satisfactory. Even the youngest child could mete out the punishment without fear of reprisal. All during meals, we watched each other, and particularly Dad, for an opportunity. Sometimes the one who spotted a perched elbow would sneak out of his chair and walk all the way around the table so that he could catch the offender. Dad was quite careful about his elbows, but every so often would forget. It was considered a feather in one's cap to thump any elbow, but the ultimate achievement was to thump Dad's. This was considered not just a feather in the cap, but the entire headdress of a full Indian chief. When Dad was caught and his elbow thumped, he made a great to-do over it. He grimaced as if in excruciating pain, sucked in air through his teeth, rubbed the elbow, and claimed he couldn't use his arm for the remainder of the meal.
Occasionally, he would rest an elbow purposely on the edge of the table and make believe he didn't notice some child who had slipped out of a chair and was tiptoeing toward him. Just as the child was about to reach out and grab the elbow, Dad would slide it into his lap. I've got eyes in the back of my head, Dad would announce. The would-be thumper, walking disappointing, disappointingly back to his chair, wondered if it wasn't just possible that Dad really did. Both dad and mother tried to impress us that it was our responsibility to make guests feel at home. There were guests for meals almost as often as not, particularly business friends of dad since his office was in the house. There was no formali formality and no special preparation except a clean napkin and an extra place at the table. If a guest is sitting next to you, it's your job to keep him happy, to see that things are passed to him, dad kept telling us. George Isles, a Canadian author, seemed to Lillian to be an unhappy guest. Mr. Isles was old and told sad but fascinating stories. Once upon a time, there was an ancient poor man whose joints hurt when he moved them, whose doctor wouldn't let him smoke cigars, and who had no little children to love him, Mr. Isles said. He continued with what seemed to us to be a tale of overwhelmingly lo overwhelming loneliness, and then concluded, and do you know who that old man was? We had an idea who it was, but we shook our heads and said we didn't. Mr. Isles looked sadder than ever. He slowly raised his forearm and tapped his chest with his forefinger. Me, he said. Lillian, who was six, was sitting next to Mr. Isles. It was her responsibility to see that he was happy, and she felt somehow that she had failed on the job. She threw her arms around his neck and kissed his dry old man's cheek. You do, too, have little children who love you, she said on the brink of tears. You do, too. Whenever Mr. Isles came to call after that, he always brought one box of candy for Mother and us and a separate box for Lillian. Ernestine used to remark, in a tone tinged with envy, that Lil was probably New Jersey's youngest gold digger, and that few adult gold diggers ever had received more in return for less. Dad was an easygoing host, informal and gracious, and we tried to pattern ourselves after him. Any more vegetables, boss? He'd ask mother. No? Well, how about mashed potatoes? Lots of them. And plenty of lamb. Fine. Well, sir, I can't offer you any ve any vegetables, but how about... Oh, come on, have some more beef, Frank urged a visiting German engineer. After all, you've only had three helpings. There's no need to gobble your grapefruit like a pig, Fred told a woman professor from Columbia University, who had arrived late and was trying to catch up with the rest of us. If we finish ahead of you, we'll wait until you're through. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I can't pass your dessert, can't pass your dessert until you finish your lima beans, Dan told a guest on another occasion. Daddy won't allow it, and you're my responsibility. Daddy says a Belgian family could live a week on what's thrown away in this house every day. Daddy, do you think that what Mr. Fremingville is saying is of general interest? Lil interrupted a long discourse to ask. Dad and mother, and most of the guests, laughed away remarks like these without too much embarrassment. Dad would apologize and explain the family rule involved and the reason for it. After the guests had gone, Mother would get us together and tell us that while family rules were important, it was even more important to see that guests weren't made uncomfortable. Sometimes after a meal, Dad's stomach would rumble, and when there weren't any guests, we'd tease him about it. The next time it rumbled, he'd look shocked and single out one of us. Billy, he said, please, I'm not in the mood for an organ recital. That was your stomach, Daddy. That was your stomach, not mine, Daddy. You can't fool me. You children have the noisiest stomachs I've ever heard. Don't you think so, Lily? Mother looked disapprovingly over her mending. I think, she said, there are Eskimos in the house. One night, Mr. Russell Allen, a young engineer, was a guest for supper. Jack, in a high chair across the table from him, accidentally swallowed some air and let out a belch that resounded through the dining room and as we found out later, was heard even in the kitchen by Mrs. Cunningham. It was such a thorough burp, and had emerged from such a small subject, 
that all conversation was moment momentarily suspended in amazement. Jack, more surprised than anybody, looked shocked. He reached out his arm and pointed a chubby and accusing forefinger at the guest. Mr. Allen, he said in offended dignity, please, I'm not in the mood for an organ recital. Why, Jackie, said Mother, almost in tears. Why, Jackie, how could you? Out, roared Dad. Skidoo. Tell Mrs. Cunningham to give you the rest of your supper in the kitchen, and I'll see you about this later. Well, you say it, Jack sobbed as he disappeared toward the kitchen. You say it when your stomach rumbles. Dad was blushing. The poise which he told us he valued so highly had disappeared. He shifted uneasily in his seat and fumbled with his napkin. Nobody could think of a way to break the uneasy silence. Dad cleared his throat with efficient thoroughness, but the silence persisted and it hung heavily over the table. Lack a day, Dad finally said. The situation was getting desperate and he tried again. Lack a couple of days, Dad said with a weak artificial laugh. We felt sorry for him and for Mother and Mr. Allen, who were just as crimson as Dad. The silence persisted. Dad suddenly flung his napkin on the table and walked out into the kitchen. He returned holding Jack by the hand. Jack was still crying. All right, Jackie, Dad said. Come back and sit down. You're right, you learned it from me. First you apologize to Mr. Allen. Then we'll tell him the whole story. And then none of us will ever say it again. As your mother told us, it all comes from having Eskimos in the house. Dad's sister, Aunt Anne, was an ample Victorian who wore full sweeping skirts and high ground gripper shoes. She was older than Dad, and they were, mu they were much alike and devoted to each other. She was kindly but stern, big bosom, big bosomed, and every inch a lady. Like Dad, she had reddish brown hair and a reddish brown temper. She, her husband, and their grown children, whom we worshipped, lived a few blocks from us in Providence. Aunt Anne was an accomplished pianist and gave music lessons at her house at 26 Cabot Street. Dad thought it would be nice if all of us learned to play something. Dad admitted he was as green as any valley when it came to music, but he had a good ear and he liked symphonies. Aunt Anne must have sensed almost immediately that we had no talent. She knew, though, that any such admission would have a depressing effect on Dad, who took it for granted that his children had talent for everything. Consequently, Aunt Anne stuck courageously to a losing cause for six years, in an unusual display of devotion and fortitude above and beyond the regular call of family duty. When she finally became convinced of the hopelessness of teaching us the piano, she shifted us to other instruments. Although we had no better success, the other instruments at least were quieter than the piano, and more important, only one person could play them at a time. Our Anne was shifted to the viol violin, Ernestine to the mandolin, and Martha and Frank to the cello. It was awful at home when we practiced, and Dad would walk smirking through the house with wads of cotton sticking prominently from his ears. Never mind, he said, when we told him we didn't seem to be making any progress. You stick with it. You'll thank me when you're my age. Unselfishly jeopardizing her professional reputation as a teacher, Aunt Anne always allowed each of us to play in the annual recitals at her music school. Usually we broke down in the middle and always had a demor and always had a demoralizing effect on the more talented children and on their parents in the audience. To salvage what she could of her standing as a teacher, Aunt Anne used to tell the audience before we went on stage that we had only recently shifted from the piano to stringed instruments. The implication, although not expressed in so many words, was that we had already mastered the piano and were now branching out along other musical avenues. Just before we started to play, she affixed mutes to our strings and whispered, Remember, your number should be played softly, softly as a little brook tinkling through a still forest. The way we played, it didn't tinkle. As Dad whispered to Mother at one recital, If I heard that coming from the back fence at night, I'd either report it to the police or heave shoes at it. 